right, if it's all the same to everyone else, I think this is going to be one of those ones where it's we kind of go against the whole versus title a little bit, and it's really just sort of admiring two movies that you could say are somewhat similar. You could, you could say they're in the same genre to an extent, or about um, the guys in this position that are in their own ways trying to distance themselves from their employers uh, while all hell is breaking loose uh, throughout it. So, because um, I've been looking for something to do with Road to Perdition for a long time, and somebody had suggested Miller's Crossing, and it just kind of immediately made sense. But it's like, this probably isn't going to be much of a compare and contrast thing, because both movies do what they do so well. So, um, yeah, I know for some reason some people tend to get really bent out of shape about the whole not always comparing and contrasting thing, but it's... You have to talk to Owen about that. The whole keeping the versus title thing, it's... It's a thing. But um, what I want to do first, I think, is talk about Road to Perdition. And what I really, what really kind of draws me to this and this story in particular is what I read a long time ago about what Sam Mendes said about why he decided to take this on. Because when you look at it, really, um, it's really nothing more, if you go like right into the core of it, it's really nothing more than a revenge movie. Um, but what apparently really drew Mendes to it, which you can really see come through the story, is that he said he found it appealing that it was narratively simple but thematically complex, um, which really, which a lot of the best movies can probably fall into that category, um, especially when it's the sort of setup that yeah, it sounds really cliche and predictable and all that, but it's also something that could be really easy to execute in a really big way, especially when you have a lot of really rich character work going on, and the actors that you have involved in this uh, can turn that concept into something much more profound, much like this movie does. And I think the thing that makes it really stand out in regards to... I suppose you can call it, like, both of these, it's like you could call them a gangster movie, but they're kind of so in their own worlds that they almost feel more unique than that, but if you had to put them in a genre, obviously that would be what it was. So, the difference with Road to Perdition that you see, that you don't see in a lot of other gangster movies, is that it's more or less... I mean, obviously, um, Michael Sr., Tom Hanks' character, is our protagonist, I guess you could say, but it's pretty much the whole story is from the perspective of the child, Michael Jr., um, Tyler Hecklin, and I believe his first movie, and that's kind of what brings the power to it almost immediately, where, like, you could almost say, it almost feels like you could mistake it for a coming-of-age movie if you didn't know what it was and you saw, like, the first ten minutes or so and just set in this era where it's we see all the different characters but because we at the time he doesn't know what his dad does for work or what Paul Newman's character does for work or all that or Daniel Craig or any of them but these are people that he's always around but they have that way of like the way they shoot Hanks from his perspective where it's like there's definitely we can see that distance where it's like through ajar doors and stuff like that and and then the whole thing of, it almost seems like he favors the younger child, which ends up coming back later. But, it, yeah, and then that whole thing of just, basically when you're a kid and being intimidated by almost all adults in one way or another, and, like, when we see, you know, the run, those different scenes with Hanks, or we see the younger kids run in with uh, Daniel Craig, or the, or the scene even when he goes, um, when Michael Jr. goes to get Paul Newman's coat, and Daniel Craig's just hanging out in there, and he's like, just go away, I'm busy right now, and he's just laying on the couch, like, smoking. But because we immediately get that vibe seeing the Daniel Craig character, Connor, from a child's perspective, that even if you had a task, you would be intimidated enough to say, oh, I'm sorry, and just leave the room, and completely forget what your task is. And, there, and there's something that really captures that, like, something that captures the way children see adults that's actually, like, really relatable probably to most people, even today, despite the era that it's set in, because they pull that off surrealistically. And the real great tragedy of that whole setup is that we have one character that's kind of comforting when all other adults seem intimidating, and that, of course, is Paul Newman. 
Um, and the Rooney character, when we first see him, he's almost like a... He's like a surrogate grandfather to them. And, we, like, they're... He's, like, the one adult that they'll just run up to besides Jennifer Jason Lee, obviously. Um, but the thing is, is we know eventually, if we're watching it multiple times, like I have done with this movie, that obviously all the tragedy that happens comes from the Newman character and knowing all the directions this goes. Even the, the child himself, like the youngest child, who is, like, so seemingly comfortable around he he even seems kind of comfortable around daniel craig because of the whole you know asking him why what he's laughing at and it's like these are the people that are going to be responsible for his like really tragic death and his mother's death simultaneously and set off the whole events of this thing and he's like the one adult that seems comforting uh, at the start of it and that whole thing and, that, and bringing in like that whole family dynamic um, which is one of the big themes of it, particularly Fathers and Sons, where you look at, you've got Hanks and Hecklin's characters, obviously, who are at the center of it, and their whole relationship is what we follow. And then on the side, you've got what's going on with the Roonies, with Paul Newman and Daniel Craig, and how there's that, you know, one minute Paul Newman has to beat him over the head for, you know, killing the child and, do, and taking things way too far than they deem to, and just kind of being an overall fuck-up. Um, and betraying his own family eventually and then it's but there's still like that love at the end of the day um, especially and it comes in in that scene but it's also especially prominent in the later scenes with Stanley Tucci when we realize that he's being protected regardless of what's going on um, and then of course the relationship between Michael and Rooney them, Michael Sr. and Rooney and the whole they're, not, they're obviously not like you know blood related but it's there and how everybody, pretty much everybody in this movie is betraying somebody or going against somebody um, after it was all like this joint family at the start of it. Um, and it's, and it turns the whole movie basically from, you can take like, you know, the gangster thing and the revenge plot and all that. And obviously at the end of the day, it's going to be a tragedy. Um, and that's to not even mention some of the characters we haven't mentioned yet, but... It is worth noting uh, Newman's performance was, um, he got his last Oscar nomination for this, and this was the last time he was on screen, anyway, because this was before, like, the biggest thing he had after this was Cars, which obviously he did voice work for, um, so I believe this was the last time he was on screen, and we actually saw him, um, and it's a, it's a big perform, it's, it's a big and small performance at the same time, which is what makes it so great, where he seems so in control like I said, those scenes where he seems like grandfatherly, or there's that scene of him and Michael Sr. at the piano uh, that's really great. But then there's something he can do with his eyes that's like so cold, where we can see, especially in the scenes when we're confronting this whole thing, we can see the coldness that would come that would result in Connor going to their house and shooting up the family, and then going on all this, bringing Jude Law into the mix doing all that stuff. There's the whole scene with uh, None of Us Will See Heaven, and it's like there's just everything he does with his eyes pretty much says everything. Um, which is very interesting because one of the things that was most appealing famously to a lot of people of young Paul Newman, like back in the 60s, was his eyes, the 50s and 60s. So the fact that they were, they were almost used in the opposite sense um, as he got older um, is a really interesting way to do that so yes that was an Oscar nomination well deserved even if he's actually not even in the movie that much um, but the impact is there and you can say that about a lot of the supporting players in this most notably for me um, Jude Law was always the one that really stood out he's the, because the, the pacing of this movie um, despite the build-up is actually really well done like this this movie feels extremely fast to me every time I watch it especially with all the stuff that goes down and then when Jude Law makes his presence known. I always forget, because it seems to come so quickly, that Jude Law does not come into the movie until about an hour in. And the movie's less than two hours. It's like an hour 55. Um, but when he's in it, you you remember him until you don't have to, and then the movie sneaks up on you. <laughs> but the thing about this is, it's also worth noting, I didn't mention yet, um... Red Edition obviously is based on a graphic novel, 
and there is one character in particular that is not in that novel that the screenwriter created, uh, and that is Harlan McGuire, the assassin that is brought in by um, Paul Newman and Stanley Tucci to dispatch of Michael Sr. and we're not obviously Rooney says not the kid but we've seen how the other characters in this movie work so everybody's in danger everybody's in danger <laughs> especially when you bring in a character so unrelenting like Harlan McGuire and the first time we see him you think and I love that opening shot of him um, how it does that very interesting sort of technique as he's just walking to this crime scene and then we're, of course, expecting, you know, Jude Law, like, three years before this was a talented Mr. Ripley, and he was known for, like, his really good looks and his, you know, voice and accent that are, like, butter wrapped in velvet and all that shit. And you see this guy, and he is... It's to my understanding Mendez wanted something... He wanted to be, him to appear rat-like or rodent-like. And I think they accomplished that. And it's like every, like, there's, just in these moments alone, when he's photographing this dead body, it's like each individual aspect of his appearance is revealed one by one. Because um, at first it's like, oh, there's Jude Law and, you know, the suit and the hat and all that. Um, and then we get a close-up of his hands when he's opening the camera, and we see his nails are, like, long and dirty and look almost like weird claws. And then, when he realizes the body's still alive, he takes a second to, like, wipe the sweat uh, from his brow, and he takes his hat off, and he's got this weird balding thing going on. <laughs> and then later on in the diner, he smiles at the waitress, and we see that his, his teeth are, like, really small and really fucked up looking. <laughs> and then there's there's even the walk that he has, where it's, like... When he's walking at the beginning to the crime scene and we get that first shot of him, he's he's toting all of his equipment so we can't quite get a look at it. Um, but when he's walking towards the diner later, he's like it's like it's it's almost penguin like. <laughs> it just ev everything about him just oozes off putting and almost doesn't even belong in this world. Which I say as a compliment, because it's not like he's out of place, but like entirely, but he's just out of place enough that it's startling, and you know there's something way off about him. And any time he walks into a screen, there's a good chance something horrible is going to happen, or we're going to get very close to that. We also see him with uh, what appears to be that prostitute later, and we get like his full form outside of his suit and his jacket, and he's got like that really almost like gaunt thing like there's just he's got that really thin way about him just everything everything about this dude is unnatural which makes the diner scene so cool <laughs> because even though he's got that weird walk and he's got the fucked up teeth which is the stuff we can see and his nails we get we get that one shot of them just clacking against the table he when he speaks he still sounds like jude law so he can be like really unassuming so there's this whole, the whole tension during this scene, the suspense, where we know immediately who he is, and it doesn't take Sullivan long to figure that out either, but the way he's, it reminds me of um, Robert Shaw and From Russia With Love, when they're on the train and he's just kind of taking the guise of somebody that's, you know, just sort of, just kind of a going from one place to the next and just happens to be passing through, and you can just carry on a conversation with, and there's that great moment when he says, um, my job is I shoot the dead. And then he just kind of throws his eyes back and says, they're dead bodies. I don't kill them. As if, well, that would be insane if I killed them. And we already know the truth. <laughs> we already know the truth at that point. I could see some people maybe thinking he's a bit, you know, cartoonish in a sense that it may be out of place. But I love, I love the contrast um, between the two. And I love the fact that it's based on a graphic novel. And this is absolutely 100% seems like a character that would come out of a graphic novel, and he was, like, the one major character that was created by the screenwriter. <laughs> um, so that, so that's amazing. Um, and then we've got, um, uh, uh, there's also some really, uh, talking about the suspense scenes, um, there is also the scene when Connor kills Jennifer Jason Lee and the youngest kid at the start, and there's that great moment that also kind of brings in the, uh, cinematography into the mix, the Comrade Hall cinematography, with Mendez reuniting with him after 
both of their Oscar success on American Beauty. And, yeah, the way this movie is shot is something you just kind of have to see to really take in. And it's and a lot of it does the storytelling by itself. That There doesn't even really have to necessarily be dialogue. But they can also use that to their advantage to create suspense. Like, the great moment when... I mean, it's, it's, it's been used quite a few times now. Um, I know Get Out recently used it also. But it's the really great shot of... How like when coming to the door after it's all happened and Connor's still in there and he's looking through a window and he thinks that he's been seen by Connor but it's actually Connor looking at his own reflection in the window um, and like his own reflection hides Michael Jr. and it's this really great shot but it also adds to those suspenseful scenes and then there is a just a masterful scene a scene I was talking about at the beginning of earlier and that is when Michael is confronting the accountant, this gloriously flamboyant performance from Dylan Baker, and the way this scene plays up, where we've been seeing Michael go from bank to bank in this little montage, and we kind of expect something similar when he gets there, until we realize that McGuire is across the street, and, this, and the way this scene builds up ha starts to happen so quickly, but at the same time, there's enough build-up that it is so incredibly suspenseful. Because we see McGuire realize what's going on over here, so he starts heading in this direction. There's the whole thing of Michael Jr. needs to honk if anything's if any shit's going down. But then we've got um, Rance's machine like clacking really loudly to where he can't... Not only can he not hear the horn outside, but that's just... That's just a sound that just gets to you so much the longer it goes on that it's single-handedly ramping up the suspense itself as we're cutting back and forth to McGuire, getting his gun and coming across the street um, with, obviously, the warning being drowned out. Um, so a shootout will take place here, and that just that whole build-up... The whole build-up is signif significantly more nerve-wracking than the shootout itself. The shootout itself is really well done also. Um, especially the way it's done, like, through the walls and shit. Um, and all, all of that stuff just works really well. But talking about montages, like, Michael going from bank to bank, um, there is a great montage in the middle of this movie where you, all, you kind of talk about contrast in a different sense now. Um, whereas, where we had McGuire making the uneasy tension even more so with how much he contrasts with the background... Now we kind of go the other direction, and there's another contrast that the movie finally gives us a little bit of lightness. And usually that might seem a bit out of place, especially if it just comes in so late. But the relationship between the two is something that we're so invested in at this point that it feels less like we're getting sort of a light feel a little too late, and more so that we're getting a light feel that we kind of need in this moment, because it's been so dark up to this point. It's like, it, we're finally ready to see the two of them become more of a father and son, despite their kind of... always like it, it almost feels like the distance between them has solidified itself by this point, and, but they're still going to try to break through that anyway. Um, so we, if we start off with this, real, this montage that's almost comedic of, you know, Michael Jr. trying trying to be the getaway driver, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. Um, and in the Bonnie and Clyde scene, when they're just at, you know, another diner, and they just say, oh yeah, we, we've been robbing banks, that's just what we do. Um, and, and the way that sort of unveils the relationship between them, starting with the teaching him to drive thing, and then we get this really heartbreaking scene where they finally have, like, a real heart-to-heart, -heart, and it's the scene where we come back to... You know, Michael Jr. wondered if the younger kid was loved more than he was. And it's like, and it's, you would think if there was a favorite child here, it would be the one that shares his name. But it's like, and there's an interesting sort of thing there because it's like the kid that shares his name, he is so focused on that child being anything but him. And that's pretty much his whole main conflict and why we're kind of here to begin with to get him away from this life in general. Um, and it's the moment when Michael Sr. just says, you know, it's, he, he was basically afraid that he was going to be more like him. Like, he, he was afraid he was going to live up to his name. 
um, and the whole idea of that that's basically where the whole distance has been coming from this whole time out of like like it it was out of love in a certain sense that Michael Jr. would have never otherwise known he would have seen it as the exact opposite of what it was um, if they hadn't had this one moment and Michael Sr. explained it in the best way that he could um, which just really that's that's kind of a tragedy in itself like even if even if this movie had an overall happy ending, um, and both of them got to survive and live in that beach house, um, just there, there would still be something so tragic in that sense that it, it took those moments and those feelings, kind of just lingering there, uncertain, to eventually get to this point to where they understand each other more or less. But then, obviously, in lives like this and stories like this, um, we just eventually have to reach the inevitable. Like, we know we know it's coming, but that doesn't necessarily do anything to the impact itself. Um, so we have all the different confrontations. Obviously, the Roonies have got to go. And we have this incredible scene. The scene that probably almost single-handedly won at the Cinematography Oscar. <laughs> when they go out in the rain... And Rooney and all of his guys are out there and they're getting into the car. And then suddenly, a hellfire comes from the darkness in what appears to be a small flash from one gun. One person. One one-man army. And then we get that shot of Rooney standing around all the bodies of his dudes and it's just him. And then they come together and it is one of the most profound ways somebody has spent the last seconds of, the, of their on-screen screen time of their career. Was there a better way for us to see Paul Newman for the last time on screen than telling Tom Hanks, I'm glad it's you, before being gunned down in that fashion? And it's... And there's just so much emotion in this scene. Like, it could have been... Like, it, like I talk about it being, in a sense, a revenge movie of sorts as a very vague outline. Um, but it's this scene is just all tragedy and wounded betrayal and all that stuff. And it's in the... And I, think, I feel like the rain just really kind of brings that whole point home, just brings that whole melancholic feeling there, and it's... Yeah, it's pro it's probably the most famous scene in the movie, would it not be? I I believe so. So, yes, and then obviously he he kills Connor rather unceremoniously, which you know is is a fitting end to somebody that's uh, put that much tragedy in your life, them personally, uh, given that he's the one that pulled the trigger both times. But then we get to our I guess you could almost say it's an epilogue, almost. Um, where we think everything has been said and done, and they're at the beach house, and everything's fine. And the way this scene is shot, I don't, I'm not sure how this movie pulls it off, because I remember, because it's something that's been done to death at this point. Like, um, like I remember mentioning the Liam Neeson movie Run All Night is pretty much a modern remake of this movie, and I don't think it was meant to be. <laughs> um, I think they just robbed this movie, more or less. But um, the idea that the, I can't say hero, protagonist of the movie, I guess, um, still has to meet his inevitable end. And I remember that a big reaction when it first came out was it was such a gut punch of an ending because people forgot about Maguire. And when you look at that, it's so interesting that Jude Law has created just this extremely memorable character, and he's one of those characters where... You know, like, he immediately makes his impact where it's like he's brought in and it's like, oh, you know, he's, you know, our best guy. He's the guy that you want to call to do this thing. And that's not exaggerated. It takes, he has an introduction scene and then it takes him one scene with barely any dialogue to find them. And then he just immediately goes to where they are. And that's, <laughs> and so you expect, you just kind of expect his character to be this good. And then once he is, um... What's the word I'm looking for? Incapacitated after the shootout in uh, Dylan Baker's apartment. Um, and he gets, you know, the glass in his face and, like, deformed. And then we just kind of leave him there. Um, and I think it's because the scenes where he takes out the Roonies are so effective and so strong and feel like they're tying up the story so much. That's how people 
te just take a moment to forget one of the more memorable characters in the movie um, for this final payoff. And that in itself is brilliantly done, if it can get you to that point. Some people may have been expecting Maguire to have been sitting behind him, but um, I know it also catches a lot of people off guard, at least back then it did. Um, and the way they were able to maneuver around him being such a memorable character to make you forget him for just that one instant, um, then it's, yes, it's perfectly done. Um, and then the whole thing of Michael Jr. being right in the moment to be able to become him and has a gun, and this is the perfect instance to use it, um, and Michael Sr. saves him by doing it himself. Uh, saves him from any sort of life like that, because you would know, like, if he had pulled that trigger on McGuire, even if it was to save his own life, he probably would have gone down a different path. But the fact that in his dying moments, Senior was able to save him at the last minute, not just from McGuire, but from that whole life, um, it just kind of makes it a perfect ending, really, and just says everything it needs to say in those final moments. And, yeah, so... Despite inexplicably, inexplicably missing out on a Best Picture nomination, which is very unfortunate, this did still manage to score six nominations. Obviously, it won Cinematography. Newman was nominated, and then there was Production Design, of course, the Sound Categories, of course, and the incredible Thomas Newman score, um, which really just sets the mood for a lot of these scenes, especially as it... It can get big without going too overbearing and just make everything even more super dramatic than it already is without being unnecessary. So, it, and actually like fueling the scenes. So that's, yeah, so just, I, I love just about everything about this movie. So that's how I'll leave that. Um, as far as Miller's Crossing goes, Miller's Crossing, which is the third Coen Brothers movie after Blood Simple and Raising Arizona. Um, they decided to go into the gangster genre as well, but once again, it's always kind of hard to say a Coen Brothers movie is a particular genre because the Coen Brothers just kind of are their genre. Like, they're just, they have their own worlds and their own settings and all that, and their worlds have their own rules and their own language. And this is a really good example of that also. It's not one of their more popular movies, um, at, least, at least as far as when you look at their lineup and the movies people tend to mention the most, I think that may have to do with the fact that, um, at least for, uh, I thought it was just me, because I knew the movie was, like, really critically acclaimed, but I had heard, I started to hear this more than once from people just me, than just me, which is that it doesn't always hit people the first time around. It's a movie that you kind of have to see multiple times, which is usually what I like to do with Coen Brothers movies anyway, because um, there's just so much stuff that they put in there um, to catch, but this one in particular was one I saw once and was like, oh, that's kind of underwhelming, especially coming from them, and then I just kind of didn't revisit it again for a while, and then when I did, I ended up watching it again shortly after, and it was like, I think I, think I get it now. Um, and <laughs> so... Um, the first thing to talk about is this opening scene, um, where we meet the two rival gangsters played by John Polito and Albert Finney. And what I really love about this scene in particular is not only is it just, like, an immediate sort of back and forth between these two big characters, but it's the way that they are big in different ways. Like, they, they basically represent the two different types of gangsters we come to know in the more classic and traditional movies that are of this sort where you've got the really loud, boisterous sort of Edward G. Robinson type with John Polito, and then with Finney on the other side of him, you've just got, like, really stoic and, like, doesn't say a whole lot, and when he just says, like, two words, they just, like, really hit, and you immediately feel like you understand the character, where he's, like, um... When Polito's going through his whole thing, and he's like, you know, do you, is it clear what I'm saying? And Leo just says, as mud, just in that tone, and it just immediately feels like we set up these two sides. Um, but what's interesting about this is before the scene is over, and before we go into the opening titles, um, Casper, the um, John Polito character, has his triumphant exit and says, you know, like, shit's gonna really hit the fan if you don't take out John Turturro, and we are gonna have problems, so, you know, we're gonna, this is gonna get bad, and then he leaves. And then once he's gone, that sort of stoic figure that Albert Finney was behind the desk 
starts talking to Gabriel Byrne, who's our protagonist. It's much like Michael Sullivan. It's like protagonist in a sense. I wouldn't call him a good guy at all. <laughs> um, but he's the protagonist, I guess you could say. The character we're going to follow through this. Um, and immediately it's like Leo's a different character when he's not more into the business. Like he's like he, he seems like stoic and exactly knows like what power moves to make. But then the second he's behind closed doors with Gabriel Byrne and we start to see the real side of him, it's like he's got like this arrogant recklessness to him. Not in the same sen not in the same way that Casper does, but just in another sense. When it's like he he even straight up says, you know, Byrne is like you need to really think about this whole taking out John Turturro thing. And Fanny's just, you know, you know I don't like to think. And it's like, well, that's, it's such a different tone than we got when he was dealing with Casper. Um, and then the fact that the whole thing comes from the fact that the only reason he's even protecting Turturro's character, Barney, is because he has an unrequited, he has like, he's unrequitedly lovesick for Verna, the Marcia Gowden character. And it suddenly becomes, we start to see, like, all the flaws in this character right away before the opening titles even happened. When when the scene started, he seemed like a stone wall. And it's like, that's, and the way Finney's able to do both of those is, like, it's it's an amazing opening scene. and says so much about the characters right away um, before we even see the title of the movie, which is great. Um... And this was at a time when we had the frequent collaborators of the Coen brothers. Obviously, um, Carter Burwell still, but Carter Burwell here kind of really shows off that Burwell's one of those composers that has a very, very lengthy filmography. He has done the music for so many different movies, and he's done so many different styles and types of score. Like, when you look at stuff like, um, like Danny Elfman, for instance... No matter what director he's working with or what kind of movie he's doing, more often than not, you can identify his scores immediately, which is great. It's always great for an artist to have, like, a signature, um, but also be able to do different things with that signature. But Burwell ha it does these great scores that sound totally different for other movies, but every time he does a Coen Brothers movie, it's like he has a specific sound that he brings to them that is instantly identifiable. Um, and th so I've always loved that, and it's especially prominent here as well. Um, and then this was at the time, pre The Addams Family, where he took off himself, where Barry Sonnenfeld was doing their, was their cinematographer, as he was for Blood Simple and Raising Arizona. Um, and so, and all that is going to bring to life this very Coen Brothers world. Um, which is, which is especially an interesting contrast after something as, like, zany as Raising Arizona. Um, which is which is not to say that Raising Arizona is any lesser for being that type of movie. Raising Arizona is a masterpiece, <laughs> um, and that, that that they went in such a different direction, and that that that's kind of what their careers have been about. Is they do one thing, and then they're able to do something entirely different the next. But their style is just so there, like it feels like they're all kind of in the same world and universe um, because they just have that. Um, and then bringing in uh, some of the other side characters, like uh, like John Turturro, for instance. Um, the one that's kind of causing the trouble at the center of all this just by being alive and messing with the fixed fights that Casper's doing and just fucking up that whole business. And you you we get a sense of him through dialogue. And this is the way a lot of characters are in this movie. Um, and it's it's almost like an event when we actually see them because all the characters are so talked about throughout it, and the we get kind of a vibe of Bernie by the way Casper talks about him and the things that he does. Like we get the idea that he's probably super wormy uh, and stuff like that. And so the first time we see him, I love his introductory shot where his introductory shot we don't even know he's there. <laughs> we're looking we're looking at the back of a chair. And it looks like no. It looks like an empty chair facing away from us is what it looks like. And then uh, Tom, the Gabriel Byrne character, comes in, sits down, takes a phone call, and is looking ahead this whole time. And it's only after he hangs up and acknowledges that Bernie's in the room that we realize he's been looking at Bernie this whole time. And then we get that cut of Totoro. And the reason we didn't see him in the chair is the way he is like slouched all the way down. And, like, his arms are in, and he just, he, at the same time, he has that look of, like, oh, yeah, 
It's just by the look of the start of him, just the way he's sitting, we can see this is the guy that is causing all of this trouble <laughs> and just making life hell for all of these people. Um, and uh, But at the same time, just the way that... And, and what's interesting about that also is how concise it is because we talk about the way Sonnenfeld perfectly brought these images to life. But I've talked about before... Uh, when I talked about, like, Barton Fink and Blood Simple, that um, I have this book um, that's a collection of Coen Brothers screenplays, and it's, it's the first four. It's Blood Simple, Raising Arizona, this, and Barton Fink. And when you read Coen Brothers scripts, they are, like, all the way down to it. Like, they describe the shots exactly as they look. Like, the angles and everything are specified in the script. Like, you talk about... They're so specific about their dialogue, like all the um, like all the uhs, ums, and mans in the Lebowski script are exactly as scripted, and it's like their their directional um, wording in their scripts is just like that also. Like it is exactly right down to it. Like reading one of their scripts is literally just watching the movie, basically just in your head. Um, and the fact that all, they get all the specifics of this down before they were even on a set. Um, just really shows how clear their visions are and how well put together all of this stuff is. Um, and talking about um, how much I love Torturo in this movie, uh, particularly, probably the most famous scene in the movie has to be when he's taken out the Miller's Crossing and begs for his life. And, and the way that that kind of is brought back, it, not only is it brought back at the end in a different way, and Tom's obviously in a different place, um, especially with him as a character, but there's also the way that the kind of character Bernie is, is we never quite know when we're being played by him or not. If you watch it enough, it basically, basically anytime Bernie is on screen, somebody is being played. Uh, <laughs> and it's like, but at the same time, knowing the motives of the Bernie character, every time you watch that scene at Miller's Crossing, there is he manages to convince you that Bernie is really, really, truly begging for his life, and you really feel like that Bernie is seconds away from death, even though, number one, we know Bernie's motives, and secondly, we know that the first time around, Tom doesn't do it, but the suspense is always there in that scene, because Totoro does that so convincingly. Um, and I love the way that Miller's Crossing, in general, just brings about so much tension, just because... With the, we learn what happens at that place, that the two major scenes that were there, um, like, it makes perfect sense that it's the movie's title. It, there's, there is no more perfect title to this movie um, because of what this place represents. And the most tense scene of the movie, of course, has to be when they take Tom out there and they're like, we're gonna, you're gonna take us to Bernie's body or you're gonna be out here the way he was until they come across what is eventually Mink's body. But, and it, and it's so tense, it's, it's like warranted when Tom just has to stop at a tree and puke, which is the, the telltale sign to them. It's like, well, that means Bernie's not here, of course. Well, let's do this. And it's like, that moment is so tense when they're walking out there. Much like the scene where Bernie's begging for his life, it's like, we already know the outcome, even so... It, 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 that scene is just so incredibly tense. I almost can't even look at the screen during that sense. And that, that has nothing to do with the whole, you know, I can't watch people puke thing. That is just the tension. I can barely watch that scene leading up to that. <laughs> um, even despite knowing the outcome, which is great. Um, and then, and, and that's the thing too, is talking about Torturo and Polito and Finney and everything else they bring, is that... Usually in movies like this, especially with so many colorful characters, there's always at least that one supporting player that like really stands out to you personally more than the others, even if everybody is fantastic. Um, like Jude Law, for instance, for me in Road to Perdition. Um, I can't pick a favorite in regards to supporting characters and performances in this. On some days it might be Totoro, on some days it might, Poli might be Polito, on some days it might be Finney. Um, and I can see people throwing a bone to uh, Jay Freeman playing Eddie Dane also um, is a really great character as well. Uh, and kind of like more, like one of the more looming threats in the entire thing, even despite the fact that we have, you know, crazy assholes like Casper running around. Um, and there's also, obviously there's little uh, cameos here and there, like um, Francis McDormand is there for like a split second as like the mayor's secretary, um, who is always nice to see pop up in these. And then... 
there is um, the Coens' old buddy Sam Raimi there uh, right before they blow the building up, and then he's the one that gets blown away. Um, the, it's like, it was, I, sometimes I forget their connection, because um, obviously, um, I think the Coen brothers kind of did some work on the original Evil Dead, um, so they've been like, the whole thing for a while there, and it's like, and you can kind of see inspiration between the two. There was obviously a lot of Coen inspiration when Raimi did A Simple Plan. Um, and to just kind of see them, see him pop up and just be like this little playful appearance, um, is really great. It kind of shows like the camaraderie of their sets and their returning people, not just in the tech department, but on screen as well, even if it's just for kicks. Um, and it's cause you, cause you know, they, they had to have gotten a kick out of just blowing Raimi away in such a violent fashion. Like that was probably such a blast for all of them. <laughs> um, but then there's also characters like Mink who is played by Steve Buscemi, and talking about characters who, like, spend most of their time off screen, like, uh, like Lazar, the guy that Tom owes money to, and is, like, his whole threat throughout the movie, is a guy we never see, as far as I remember. Um, and then there is Mink, and we see Mink once, and I've talked about many times before about the Coen brothers having that way of making characters memorable with just, like, one scene. Um, and it's like, it's, it's usually some like offbeat character played by like a non-actor or an actor that's not a big name and they just have like those one moments and that's it. And here, Buscemi shows up as Mink in this scene and he's like, he's what we know, um, Buscemi characters to be, especially in Coen Brothers movies. He's like really, really fast talking and he's like really nervous. And then we never see Mink on screen again. He's on screen for like 20 seconds. Yet Mink is such a major <laughs> he's such a major character through this whole thing. And it's like you you almost tend to forget we hear his voice over the phone like one more time. But he is mentioned so much and plays such a big part. And even his corpse. His corpse is a huge deal. His corpse saves Tom's life <laughs> in the most tense scene of the movie. And he's a character we actually see for like twenty seconds. It is crazy how they're able to do characters like that, um, but amazing nonetheless. Um, and then obviously talking about the way they build their own world, especially with di the dialogue. Um, this is one of the, they have this way, especially in a movie like this, where in another movie, you can imagine another screenwriter trying what they do with the dialogue in this, and it almost coming off a bit too try-hard. Um, but it just fits their characters and their world so well, um, that you just can't help but love it. Like, the moment when, um, he's walking, I want to say it's the Michael Jeter scene, when they're walking down the sidewalk, and he's talking about the horse getting down on its knees, um, but he's saying, like, um, he stops the conversation to say, what do you call a horse's knees? Like, there, is there another word for that? And then when he's, when he learns what the word is, he completely rephrases it all over again just for the sake of sounding clever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, even a character that just has one scene, it still feels like it fits. Um, and then there's the moment when he's, like, confronting the cop, where the cop is, like, you know, being a bit confronting and saying he sees through this. And then when Tom gets even the slightest bit threatening, the cop, of all things, says, I was just speculating about a hypothesis. I didn't mean anything. <laughs> and it's, like, stuff like that is just so odd um, that it works and it fits. There is um, there is a line that Tom uses that I may or may not have used in real life maybe a number of times when he says, um, he's not a bad guy if looks, brains, and personality don't count. And, it's, <laughs> and just, don't, like I said, and, and with a less, you know, talented writer or writers, um, that would just come off like, just, yeah, it, it just wouldn't work. But there's something about the way it combines with this world and their style that it's, yeah, it all comes together. Um, and would be what they would become even more famous for as their... Because remember, we're only three movies into their filmography at this point. Um, and they would only get better as they went. And that, and that, while I could still see somebody criticizing for the dialogue for that here, um, they obviously would mu come much more into it more, and make that kind of stuff sound more natural the more um, their movies went on and the more they came out with. But there's also some stuff like the dialogue list scenes... And I love the scene when they discover um, Rug Daniels' body. That kid discovers Rug Daniels' body. Where there's no dialogue, it's just the dog looking at it uneasily, and then the kid looking at him uneasily. 
and then he just kind of takes, he realizes it's a toupee and just kind of takes off with it. And it's just this really weird, it's always something you'd see in like a silent movie or something. Um, or like a French movie in like the 40s or something. And it's, and it's just this really bizarre sort of offbeat moment. The only thing that drives me crazy is that I'm pretty sure Rug is supposed to be dead at this point, but you can like blatantly see his bottom lip moving and it's it's weird but um it's still still the um, the feel of the scene is there and then you can combat these you know quiet dialogue with scenes i feel like they're out of silent movies and then go into like full-blown action um which once again some people could probably argue seems misplaced but i love this scene um another probably the second most famous scene after bernie and miller's crossing would be the shootout at leo's house um and where we kind of get, because we talked about it at the beginning, where we see, because Leo got to this place for a reason that he's at. And then, like I was talking about at the beginning, he's revealed to be more, like, arrogant and reckless and, you know, flippant about everything. And he's lovesick. And he's and it makes him come off almost, like, weak and vulnerable without him realizing it. He thinks he's at the top of the world, but maybe he's not, if that's how he is. He Like, he almost got too comfortable at the top. But then this scene happens, and it shows us how Leo became to be what he was, and kind of shows us, like, what he probably once was. Um, where not only does is he able to um, kill the guys in the bedroom and manage to get out while the house is burning, but he, be, he starts getting shot at by a moving car and doesn't even flinch. Instead, he chases them. He chases a car by walking. <laughs> and wins in this whole thing. And that's, of course, followed up by the line, um, the old man's still in arms with a Thompson, uh, which is just perfectly encapsulates that's how Leo gets to be who he is and where he is um, and, w and why he's at the top. And then, it's, and then it all kind of starts to come back into place. But still, the layers of the character are there because every time Vern is in the mix, then he's a different character than that, of course. Um... I'm talking about Verona, the Marsha K. Harden scenes, it, there is, like, um, this is another case where, an, in another movie with less talented writers, it might seem a bit try-hard, kind of bringing back the, the banter from, like, the 30s and 40s and, like, the sort of, you know, noir movies, like the, like the back and forth that Bogart would have with his, uh, leading women, so, you have this shot, this first shot of Marsha Gay Harden just answering the door, which is probably one of the most iconic shots of her career, um, at least I would think so, and this sort of sparring that she and Tom have back and forth, it's like this the, this sort of classic dynamic um, that you would see from the lead characters of like the 30s and 40s, but it doesn't really feel like it's trying too hard to be that. Um, because these scenes don't really go on that long. They go on just long enough to establish that, but also kind of have that flair to them. Um, and then, and of course, establishing her relationships with the other characters is such a driving force for the rest of this, especially with her being Bernie's sister who's trying to do anything to protect him, whether it be, you know, being with Leo or being with Tom, doing all this stuff, um, even though the longer Bernie stays alive, the longer all this is going to go out of control. But we can see that in Leo's case, he can't really help it, and in Tom's case, it's almost like he's begrudgingly like that with her. Like, he, like he, at one point, you know, Tom will go back to her the way Leo would, but in another sense, Leo would just as easily tell her to fuck off. And we never not quite know which scene is going when they're scenes together, if they're going to end up with them saying fuck off to each other, or ending up in bed, or both. Usually both. <laughs> um, and not necessarily in a particular order. Uh, one or the other may follow. Um, and so th those scenes have always worked also. So then there's just stuff that just kind of comes from out of nowhere. We're talking about the real people being revealed or the people that they are underneath being revealed. Where we talked about Leo doing that with the scene, um, with the shootout scene. Casper gets this scene towards the end. And I'm, of course, talking about the absolute chaos that is Dane's death scene. <laughs> Which is probably one of the crazier Coen Brothers scenes, and that's saying something. That's a high bar to reach. Um, where we've got him... We think the tension is mounting around Tom, and he's the one in danger, and then Casper just starts beating Dane with this shovel from the fireplace. 
and you've got um, the boxer drop over there just screaming in this really bizarre animalistic way that can just shut off and on like a light switch uh, <laughs> as this scene progresses and then you've got him shooting Casper in the, or you've got him shooting Dane in the head and you've got Casper covered in blood and it's like oh these are okay now we're starting to see who these characters like really are underneath and there are those moments where you can see like throughout it that there is a facade here like a like a feigned elegance that they're trying to put on when in actuality they're all basically bloodthirsty psychopaths where it's like um there are the scenes with casper where he's like you know oh you know my kids and he sets this kid on his lap and everything's great and he's like he's he's like that whole sort of dawn look where it's like oh you know i may be powerful and i i may you know go after who i need to go after but i also love my family and all that and then there's this scene where the kid comes running in in the middle of him and Tom having a conversation, and just immediately, like with like no, <laughs> with like no build up or no sort of thing stopping him here, just slaps this kid across the face and starts screaming in his face um, to take a page out of Tom's book. And then it's like, and he tries to do the whole, oh, he he does the whole thing of oh, did somebody hit you thing while the kid is crying, and it's like. Yeah, Casper's probably off his fucking rocker, and this whole, oh, I'm just a businessman kind of thing, um, yeah. <laughs> it's something that's hiding something, of course, that starts to come out as all hell starts to break loose. Um, and then, yeah, but then, of course, um, through all this, and when the movie has its most insane moments, um, and all and all these things, this, this really great story of just everybody betraying everybody, and everybody doing this thing, which may benefit this thing but also go against this thing it's just this nice little web of things that's going on i think that's something that when you see it the first time around might be kind of hard to keep up with because there's so many characters some of which we don't even see so much going on so many motivations all that stuff um but once you can get them all figured out in place who's who and what place they have it's just kind of this beautiful web that's actually really well put together but then, of course, just sprinkled throughout all this, um, we've got the classic, you know, Coen Brothers humor is certainly there, uh, where we've got stuff like... The, the, the way that Tom gets either punched or beaten just pretty much becomes a running joke uh, throughout the movie and, done, and is done for, like, so many different reasons. Like, every time Tom has a scene, you can almost guarantee nine times out of ten... A Tom scene is going to be punctuated by him getting punched or beaten for one reason or another. And the more it happens, like, the funnier it becomes, because it's just, like, a running joke. The scene with Mike Starr, when he just, like, hits him once, and he just, like, walks out of the room, just almost sad, and then brings in more dudes. Um, it's just this great classic Coen Brothers moment. But there's also the whole thing about the kid taking Rug Daniels' hair. And it's like, that's a recurring thing throughout the movie. It's like, you know, who who killed him, and why would they kill him? What, what would they need to do that for? And it's like, and why did they take his hair? And the why did they take his hair keeps coming back. And it's like, like it was this almost insult after having killed him, but it's like the fact that we know from the get-go that just some kid, some random kid just took it. Like, every time it's brought up, you know, who took Rug's hair, it's like this big deal, this big mystery to them, and we can get a chuckle out of it every time because we know, and it's not that eventful. <laughs> it's not that significant at all. Um, and I, I like the fact that we know that, because that could be one of those things that's revealed like at the very end, when it's like, oh, the payoff is, it was insignificant. But it's not a payoff because we already know, so we can laugh every time it's brought up. <laughs> um, so that's uh, great. So yeah, that's basically how I feel about Moore's Crossing in a nutshell. Um, I do think Road to Perdition is the one that I come back to more um, but Miller's Crossing is one of those ways that you, you kind of just need to go back to more if you really want to appreciate it to its fullest, but, like I said, I kind of just want to drop the versus thing and just say I love both of these, um, for various reasons, but, um, I do think Road to Perdition is something especially, um, really special and it's something that I often come back to, so, that's how I feel about those. Uh, as I said, with all that's going on, I have a whole list of these that um, I'll probably be doing. I have no idea which one's the next one, but I'll get that figured out and we'll go on. Um, there's another series that's that's uh, Stephen King related I think I want to start going into also um, in the next week or so uh, to kind of keep things afloat. And then, yeah, as far as regular views go, we'll just kind of see what hits streaming and what does all that, and then we'll go from there. We'll just kind of, you know 
play that by ear or whatever. So until all that stuff, I think that's going to be it for the 